comic books have got a very strange self-esteem issue. Now maybe I ought to start being intense. I hate Miller being more intense than I am. I call my style the deadline style. Whatever comes out on time, that's my style. He's casting a check and I'm sitting there doing the work at three in the morning. It was my normal grumble. Hate me, that's fine. Just be passionate. Love me, just be passionate about it. Don't be lukewarm. Don't tell me you want to see other guys. Daredevil has always kind of been the grateful dad of comics. So I, I was on board, you know, from the get-go. But I wanted them to take it seriously. Because I took it seriously. Worked out pretty good. Ten-year overnight success. That's how it worked, yeah. I wanted something for Bill Everett to do when I when we first did Daredevil. I said to myself, here's Bill who had created the Submariner. He's one of the great talents in our business. And as far as I know, he isn't doing anything. I've got to dream something up for him. And a number of people had written articles in different papers and magazines about the fact that all of our heroes, all the ones that I had come up with were flawed. So I thought, well, I gotta find a guy with another flaw. That seems to be what turns people on. Strangely enough, I was afraid that there might be a negative reaction to a blind superhero, primarily among blind people. I felt they would feel, you know, what's this guy trying to do? We can't do things like that. Is this some sort of a, a parody? And I, I was nervous about it. And then I was amazed to find we got more fan mail in the beginning from charities for the blind. They said that the people that we're involved with are so grateful that there is a blind superhero and they love that idea. And oh man, what a relief that was for me. It, 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 it felt good to get that kind of mail. It's a funny thing about Daredevil's costume. It started out being yellow and I really am no authority on what color costumes should be. I used, I used to leave that really to the people who did the coloring in our office. And a lot of people said, we don't like the yellow costume. So being a man who makes very profound decisions, I said, okay, how about red? Now that I hate to disillusion people, but that is the amount of intensive study and thought and research and focus group meetings that we had in determining a color of a costume. <laughs> people have said to me, did you ever imagine that Daredevil would last for 40 years? In all honesty, I never thought about it with any of our characters because it's hard to describe, but in the days that we were doing all these superheroes, when we started them, all that we were concerned about was that the books would sell. So we were so involved and occupied with making every issue as good or better than the last, that the thought of what will these be like in 40 years, it never, it never occurred to me and I doubt that any of the guys was thinking of it at that time. What I always tried to do with Marvel was make it seem like a club, like a an inner group that we knew about and the outside world wasn't even aware of. If you read Marvel, you were on the inside, you were hip. And it was sort of an exclusive thing, limited just to Marvel readers. And I tried to talk to the readers as if they were friends, not readers. So that not only, hopefully, did they enjoy the stories, but they enjoyed being part of, of the Marvel mystique, you might say. 
and I'm probably making it sound much more profound than it really was, but that's the way I looked at it. I, I wanted people to be aware of Marvel, and I wanted people to know about the mysticism and the magic and the marvelness of Marvel. And um, they say if you build a better mousetrap, the world will be the path to your door, but the world will only do that if it knows the mousetrap exists. And I didn't want us to be doing these books in a vacuum, because, you know, comic books had no advertising budget, no promotion. There were no ads on television, on the radio, in newspapers. You just printed your comic book and it was out there. And I, I was sort of like Joan of Arc. I was on a crusade, a mission, to let the world know about the marvelous world of Marvel. So in that sense, I guess I was a little bit of a huckster. To me, placing the dialogue balloons was very important because it's part of the artwork. A lot of people don't realize that. They just shove the dialogue wherever they have room. But here's a panel with an illustration. And you have space that's empty and space that's filled with line work. When you put a dialogue balloon in with a pointer or a sound effect or a caption along the top or the side or the bottom, you're contributing to the artwork. That, in essence, becomes part of the illustration. I spent more time deciding where the dialogue balloons would go than I spent writing the dialogue. Writing the dialogue was easy. Sometimes I couldn't put too much humor in the story itself because it was a highly dramatic story and you don't want to break the mood. But I tried in things like the credits, and I wrote all those things. I wouldn't let anybody else touch them for years. Every credit was different than, than the one before, and I think I had more fun dreaming up those little gags for all the credits than anything else that I did, because I love writing humor. One thing I tried to do was always use a normal vocabulary in our stories. If I wanted to use a word like um, cataclysmic or any, any word that belonged, I would. And it occurred to me that if kids were interested in a story and they came across a word that they didn't understand, they would learn what it meant just through its use in the sentence, by osmosis, so to speak, or if they had to go to the dictionary and look it up. That's not the worst thing that could happen. I was one of the luckiest guys in the world because I worked with the most talented artists you could ever find anywhere. Colan, Romita, Bill Everett, Wally Wood. I didn't, I don't think I worked with Frank Miller. I think he came along after I left. And that's a lasting regret of mine, because he too is wonderful. But we, we at Marvel were indeed fortunate. We had the best artists. They, I mean, I would give them the, the, just a notion of a plot and they went off and running and they would illustrate it. And it, it was a great working arrangement. I told Stan that I was tired of penciling. I thought I was burned out. <laughs> In 1965, I thought I was finished. Uh, and I said, I'll ink. You know, I can help you that way. If you give me pencils, I can polish them up a little bit. So the first thing he did was pull out a daredevil assignment and said, could I help him out in an emergency? And I'm, I was a sap my whole life. I was a, what I call a good soldier. And I said, sure, if you need help, I'll help you out with that. Fully expecting I'll go back to inking after I finish this one daredevil story. Of course, that lasted six months, I think. Uh, I did Daredevil, and I started to like it, thanks to Jack Kirby's indoctrination with breakdowns. This is the original uh, black and white art, uh, penciled by me, uh, written by Stan Lee, and then inked by me. Uh, this is the first splash I did in Daredevil. Um, when I brought in that pencil, Stan accepted this splash, but the pages immediately following it were a little bit quiet and uh, slow moving. So uh, Jack Kirby was uh, called and uh, inducted into the sequence. Stanley had uh, uh, elevated the art of communicating with the readers on a page called the bullpen page. He was apologizing, if you read it, for the slowness of the start. But just wait till you get to page three. That's where Jack Kirby took over. <laughs>
This is the Jack Kirby influence. In other words, instead of taking his clothes off and neatly folding them and putting them on a rack, he throws his, he takes his clothes off, he quickly gets dressed, he prepares and he leaps out the window without even looking. And you just, ho he just hopes he's going to find a flagpole or something to land on. <laughs> Almost immediately after seeing the way he paced it, uh, how nothing, nothing is slow moving, everything is quick, bang, bang, bang. Uh, I caught on almost immediately. Stan didn't have enough time to script all of these things in advance, otherwise he would have. So what he did was he would verbally or quickly dash out a half a page plot and send it to the artist. Mostly it was verbal, I think, for, just for time's sake. And, uh, and the artist then would decide what to make a splash scene and how to introduce the characters and how to unfold the story, which was at first terrified me. But almost immediately, not a, maybe in a month or two, I realized, holy mackerel, this is a much better way to do it. Comics succeeded despite doing it the wrong way. It should have always been done for, uh, visually. Once we made it a visual medium, two things happened. Every artist had his own approach to storytelling. So you had more variety instead of having a writer's personal approach. Secondly, Stan Lee discovered that after he had the silent drawings, he could now add balloons where he didn't expect to be able to add them. Sound effects could come anywhere he wanted. So he gained freedom. We gained freedom, albeit we gained a lot of time consuming responsibility but it also was much more gratifying and we became, we were able to put our stamp on the thing and it was wonderful. If anything made comics boom, I think it was that, that accident of expediency. The Kingpin is my favorite creation. Uh, Stan, uh, Stan's uh, procedure used to be, he would leave me a little card on my drawing table saying next month the character is going to be called the Kingpin. That's all. No description. No, no limitations. The sky was the limit. All the criminals, master criminals that Ditko and uh, other and Jack Kirby had created, had a similarity. They were all lean, mean-looking, mustached, with a with a felt hat and a striped suit. That what I would call the established criminal type. So when he said the kingpin of crime, I immediately was looking for the the most different look that I could. So I made him, I fashioned him after a, a Wall Street tycoon baron type. John Jr.'s run on Daredevil is probably one of the most satisfying things that ever happened because uh, it turns out that I worked on Daredevil for a short period of time but I felt like it was mine. He then took a run on it, quite a run. The thing with John Jr. is I didn't have to critique him because the thing that mattered most was storytelling, which was natural to him. And that comes about from the fact that when I started Daredevil, he was about nine or ten years old. And uh, we were plotting stories as a family. So help me, when we would drive, we would drive in a Cape Cod one time, five or six hours in the car, we were plotting Daredevil stories. Uh, he loved it. He took off. He started drawing immediately. Uh, from the time he was ten years old till he was about fifteen, he just did a, a million drawings, never showed me one. Never showed me one. He said it wasn't ready for, for me to, to look at yet. He said, when it's good, I'll let you, let you see it. And I never intruded. I, never, I had known that uh, parents can kill a, a spark faster than anybody by overdoing, overzealous following and informing and advising. No, I didn't want to do that. So after six months, I was in love with Daredevil. And Stan, he asked me, you, you know, in the third or fourth month, I did Spider-Man as a guest star. He was trying me out for Spider-Man without my knowledge. So suddenly he comes to me and said, do you think you could do Spider-Man on a monthly basis? And I said, I guess so, but I'd like to do Daredevil. And he said, uh, well, he said, Steve Ditko's leaving Spider-Man. Would you mind? And I figured, all right, I'll help him out with this. Again, the sap was there. and. Uh, I really hoped I could get back to Daredevil. I wanted to, somebody had told me that Daredevil's sales had improved while I was on it. And I was, uh, I was feeling great. I was saying, hey, wouldn't it be nice if I could move Daredevil up to be one of the top sellers? 
but I never had a chance to find out. So that run on Daredevil was like a, a, a blissful period of six months that I enjoyed myself tremendously. I loved that character. I thought that, I still to this day think Daredevil is the best character Marvel has. Hi, my name is Gene Colan, and welcome to my studio. I was on Daredevil for approximately six years. I enjoyed it, every bit of it. It was getting to the point, though, where it was getting very difficult to keep choreographing the same fight scenes and have them look different. And sometimes I would bring it up to Stan, why are there so many fights in all these stories? Why can't we get away from it? He says, because it's, it's what the fans really want to see. I kept it fresh and original by approaching it each time as if it were the first time. Each time I got a story, and I, each time I handed a story and I got another one, it was always uppermost in my mind as to how different can I make this one, and this one, and so on. And as they came in, it was, it was almost like an assembly line, but I just threw myself into it. It lived another life in a sense. I tried to get into that story myself. I tried to jump into the page and try to um, imagine what it would be like to see it visually as an outsider. What, what, what am I looking for? What am I trying to capture? If there was a fight scene, uh, I would try to do it in a way that uh, would confuse the reader. Because in, in real life, very often you don't see the, de the, the, the details. You just see action, and you don't see things flying much uh, else but arms and legs and uh, people sailing over tables uh, but you don't see the details and very often it's done in a dark room where you can even see less but it's exciting it's more dramatic that way uh, it uh, keeps the viewer on edge I wanted the, the story to be sort of uh, mystifying and sinister I was working for the older crowd and I probably didn't know I was really working for myself I just, <laughs> I had such a good time uh, doing what I wanted to do and telling a story the way I wanted to tell it. I didn't want to tell it the simplest way. I wanted to, get, I wanted to be confusing and I wanted to be complex and I wanted the reader to think about it a little bit, take it seriously, even though it's not a thing to take seriously, but I wanted them to take it seriously because I took it seriously. You have to really love what you're doing, above and beyond anything else. It's just something you're drawn to, literally drawn to, and whether you get paid or not get paid. And for anyone that's, that wants to study art or go into, uh, into art as a profession, if they're not passionate about it, the chances are they're not going to be that successful about it either. My feeling about what I'm doing, the love of, uh, that I have for it, how I want, how dramatic and how believable I want to make it to the readers, gets right into the artwork. It's an unconscious thing. And that's how a, a style, I believe, is developed too. It, that's an unconscious thing. When you have a, developed a style, it's as like, it's just, uh, recognizable as your hand, as your handwriting. Same thing. Um, but to be successful in art or any other field, you have to really love it and be totally devoted to it. Unfortunately, uh, especially in my business, uh, it, a family life is missed. It's a sad thing, but you're not really with your family that much. You're, you're married to your art. And uh, I, ha I have some regrets about that. And there's nothing I can do about it. I did the best that I could, but my art seemed to come ahead of everything. Maybe that's what makes... Uh, makes for the artist. And it meant nothing to me to stay up until say three or four in the morning to complete what I had to complete until it was right. Artists are very self-centered people. Uh, they love what they do to the exclusion of just about everything else. They kind of live in a bubble, at least the comic book artists do. I can't uh, continue the same pace. It's, I'm 76 now and I just can't keep up with it. Uh, I don't have that kind of energy, um, but I still do it. I love doing it and whenever I can, I do. But I'm trying to make up for the things that I didn't do also. 
I uh, pay a little more attention to my children, uh, to, certainly to my wife, who is uh, most 75% of the reason I'm still here. I'm very grateful to her. What I'm after when I draw my pictures is I'm after your, your guts. I, I want you to feel something. I don't want you to like me necessarily. It's like the same with my characters. And, and what I'm after when I draw is, is evocation. It's, it's not pretty. I love beauty. I don't care about pretty. I got to draw a couple of issues of, of the secondary Spider-Man title. They've guest starred this character, Daredevil, that I'd never really paid much attention to. I mean, I'd read the old Stan Lee Gene Cullen issues, and I, and I, and I really enjoyed them, but, but I had never thought of this guy as a major player. And this guy, Daredevil, I kind of dug him, because, well, how many superheroes are known for what they can't do? I mean, Superman can fly and lift you know, lift up buildings and all of that. Batman's ridiculously smart and he's got all the technology in the world and Spider-Man can spin webs and swing across buildings. Daredevil, he's blind. He can't see. That's his distinguishing feature. I fell in love. This guy was perfect. He could be the, the, the perfect hard-boiled superhero. Along the way, I decided he had to be a Catholic because only a Catholic could be a vigilante and an attorney at the same time. So I think religion and, pol and politics both have a, a very profound relation to comics because cartooning is taking reality and making it more so. It's like Hitchcock said about melodrama, is reality without, with, with all the boring parts taken out. There was a lot of ruckus when, 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 when I was working on Daredevil, as it found its voice, because the violence was so harsh, and because people were getting cut up. Mostly it was the harshness of it, the way that, that had, had, a, had a strong reaction from people, because it was as if I brought um, you know, whiskey into a playground or something. In comics, in comic books, in superhero comics, people have wasted awful lot of creative energy and hard work looking for kids who aren't there. The audience who read Daredevil was not juvenile. They, they weren't. And I got this, this character who'd been pretty, I mean, I think even the most generous people would call it a grade B character. He was the poor man Spider-Man. And, and, and everybody knew that. But I kind of saw this guy as being something much cooler. Matt's been the guy I punish for, for, for all my you know, mistakes and sins. Because <laughs> he, he really is, he is a flawed hero. In that, in that he, he's a man who intends to do good and causes much damage. Matt should have been a villain. He had a horrible childhood. His romantic life is the worst. Oh, sure, the girls look great, but they ended up dead or killing him or something. Um, and, but somehow this guy redeems himself and, and moves ahead. He just doesn't give up. He's just like his dad. With Born Again, what I was really at, it was, a, it was I think, the first of a series of works that, that, that I, I've been involved with, where I've looked at taking the machinery of the hero apart and putting it back together in, in, in leaner form so it was more pure. An awful lot of the conventions of the superheroes comes from the fear that was generated in the 1950s by, by the Senate hearings and the Comics Code and all that censorious nonsense. In Born Again, I really wanted to just say, okay, once and for all, I know you guys were moving fast. I mean, I know you guys, I know Stan, Bill, you know, Stanley, Bill Everett, Wally Wood, all the rest. I know we all have to work for a living, and I know you kind of bashed this one out, okay? But let's take a look at it. Let's take a look at what works. And the Catholicism angle worked. 
and the senses work. I mean, Daredevil is by far one of the sexiest here in comics. But beyond that, this lawyer vigilante thing, I mean, it's always been shaky. It's a, it's a fun contradiction, but it's a contradiction. And so I thought, break it down. Destroy him. And then have the real deep hero emerge. And what I thought was the winning idea was I got rid of the costume for a good long time. And so that he wasn't wearing the tights, and, and you realize the hero wasn't the costume. The costume was just dressing around the hero. I introduced Electra in the first issue of Daredevil that I wrote. I had been waiting to, to, to bring her in. I thought there was something stupid about the way superheroes always had these normal girls for girlfriends. Why? I mean, why would, why would, why would there be a Lois Lane to Superman? Why wouldn't he be running around with Wonder Woman? I mean, she can match him. Why wouldn't these people be operatic in their romance the way they are in their combat? I mean, is there anything more insipid than seeing some superhero in a love scene and all of a sudden he's just another guy who looks like us in a bed naked? No, these people bring down buildings with their passion. That's what they do with their fights. And Daredevil needed a romance that was worthy of, of him of his passion and his, and his physicality. And, and Electra is, is, is such a good Greek myth uh, from the house of Atreus, and Agamemnon as her dad, and, and as a vengeful force. And also, con, Freud named a, a complex after her. I mean, she's got issues. And, and, I, and, I, and I just expanded upon that. And also, I, I mean, it was, it, was, um, it was just an exploration of what I guess superhero sex would be like. I've been writing uh, Daredevil for, for, for a, a few months when, I, when I, I told him I wanted to steal the kingpin away from Spider-Man. And that was risable at Marvel. Like, who the hell wants the kingpin? He was the Jackie Gleason of supervillains. I mean, he, he might as well have been called Fat Man. Because what he mainly did was he used his belly to fight Spider-Man. It was, it was, he, was, he was not known as the most brilliant achievement of the Stanley regime, okay? But, I, but he was just what I needed because I needed a gang lord. And, and my, my colleague John Fern took me aside at one point and, and, you know, as he was doing his X-Men run and, and we were just having a ball being rivals at the time. And he said, you know what you got to do? He said, you do this. You draw this guy the way he's been drawn for the whole first issue he's in. And I went, yeah. John was older and entered the field earlier than I did. And he said, then you turn him into a Frank Miller character. Light him. Said, You're the guy who does the lighting. And, and, he, and he gave me a wonderful moment, which is where the kingpin goes from being this line clear guy, you know, visually conceived by John Romito, who has one of the most beautiful lines that the field has ever seen. And then I have him light up a cigarette, and all of a sudden he was mine. There was a tension with the kingpin, bullseye, and, and, and Electra and Daredevil that all was a psychodrama. Bullseye was, is the ultimate bad boy. He's, he's a psychopathic killer, yes. But he's really good at it, and he's really smart. The final act of the Electra story um, had to involve him. And she had to be cruelly and coldly murdered by the worst possible enemy Daredevil ever had because it was his ultimate humiliation along with losing the love of his life, he, he also, it was in, in, in such foul circumstance that the, that the man was mocking her as he murdered her. And I, I don't think the symbolism of that sigh going through her was lost on much anybody. I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was a rape murder in a superhero comic. It's pretty weird. I, in, I, I, to this day, I'm still surprised that, that Marvel was able to just say, okay, and in comics, you can't waste time. Comics exist in time. The reader is moving through time. It's, it's not gallery work. 
and so and so you have to know how to produce it expeditiously because that's where comics gain their energy that's what makes them sexy it's what makes them fun is that they, 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 they don't slow down in, in in an artistic sense everything is narrative what's done by the hand in, in, in comics is something that movies cannot approach We've felt so long like we were uh, like you know the retarded little bastard nephew of media that we've forgotten that we're better at certain things than they are, and and then yeah movies, movies are much better at a bunch of things. Movies are much more powerful. Movies control pace. A cartoonist has to be really smart to slow you down. A filmmaker just has to leave the camera where it is for a long time. And, and, and it's, it's a different set of virtues and, 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 and weaknesses. So yeah, I came, I came in wanting to make comics more cinematic. I stay in wanting to make them less so. I first became the artist on Daredevil because I had gotten either kicked off or I quit the X-Men. And I had this crossroads in my mind where I, I didn't know if I wanted to be a cartoonist anymore. I was really fed up with the industry. And it wasn't because of comics itself, it was personalities. The guys I was dealing with was, were boneheads, to say the least. At any rate, Ralph Macchio um, asked me if I wanted to do, do Daredevil, simple as that. He said, it's a, it's a great character. And he says, you can do full pencils and do your own storytelling, do, you know, play to your strength. And that was it, it was simple as that. I was ready to walk from the industry at that time. So it was a nice, and that actually, to me, is a turning point in my so-called comic books career. I was ready to go at that point. Then working on Daredevil, it, I suddenly got in, uh, invigorated and um, improved from then on. And I think it's got to do with the character. It's a very graceful character, as opposed to, it's the opposite of Spider-Man, who's awkward and gawky. But it's a graceful character. And uh, the costume reveals a nice uh, amount of muscle tone that you can play with. And it's a simple costume with the two Ds. And I, I actually picked that character to be the most fun to draw out of all the characters I've drawn, more than Spider-Man. Um, although the Punisher is a close second because it reminds me of my uncle. The differences between my father drawing Daredevil and me drawing Daredevil is he's just a, a better artist than I am. <laughs> I remember seeing it vividly, the first uh, things he did when I was a kid, I, they stuck in my head and he explained things to me. This guy's a blind lawyer. Wow, he's blind? I mean, being a kid at that age, you know, anything that is different was fun. And the fact that this guy's a superhero surrounded by a whole bunch of guys, and not only that, but he's blind, I gotta hear more about this guy. So in my mind, it started out as my father. By the time I got to the end of my hand, it was me. The only pressure I felt about being my father's son artistically was self-imposed. Nobody else ever gave it to me. Uh, there were people, people made comments all the time when I was first starting. You're only in this business because of your father. You wouldn't be here because your, without your father, you know. And you know, after I got finished standing on their chest and, and punching and screaming, I, it, I ended up having to draw anyway. And I was in my own mind. I wanted to be as good as my father. And if, if you're going to strive to be better or as good as someone, why not strive to be somebody that's that's great? Uh, so it was self-imposed, and yet it gave me a great incentive to work harder. I call my style the deadline style. Whatever comes out on time. That's my style. And that's, that's the truth because I've always been so greedy. You know, you try and work fast enough to get paid the bills and so on. And I want to own, own a certain car. And I, I, if nobody else in the industry says this, if they all think that it's an important medium, that's cool. But it's a money medium. You know, you make money. It's part of the life. And I was, at the time, I was paying, getting paid nothing page-wise, just like everybody else that starts out. So you tend to, tend to work on speed. <laughs> Excuse me. You tend to work in, uh, with speed. That sounds terrible too. Speed. Uh, is important to me. <laughs> Drugs have nothing to do with this. The quicker you are, the more money you make. So I, I only developed a style as far as how quickly I could work. Whatever came out, that's all I was conscious of. I was never copying anybody else. I was trying to emulate my father, but that was impossible. You would do anything every day for 26 years, 12 hours a day, you're going to get good at it eventually. If there was a change in the way my artwork looked, it wasn't a, a, an effort. It just happened. And I hear that I have blocky looking characters and, and bulky looking characters. If that's the style, so be it. And if it's not consistent, again, I'm not conscious of it. So it might just be what I ate on a Sunday, you know, and whatever comes out on Monday depends on what you eat over the weekend. Who knows?
the greatest thing I, have, I think I ever have ever done to this point, if you can call it great, was working on The Man Without Fear with Frank. And it was originally slated for 64 pages. So I started working on it. And I, I was thrilled to death working with Frank because I had pretty much gotten into the business around the same time he did. And uh, his work was just fantastic. And as a writer, it's even better than his artwork. And um, it, it, it started out 64 pages. I got about 40 pages done. He says, I got an addendum. He calls me up and he says, I have an addendum. I'm gonna throw in a couple of pages, which ended up being 80 something pages. <laughs> in between page 43 and 44, there was 80 more pages. It ended up being 144 pages, this thing. He says, listen, you won't see Daredevil in costume till the end of the book. And I said, okay, let's, let's go with it. And it was more fun and more rewarding than anything I ever did because it was, it, it was if there was ever a weakness in my storytelling, even to that point, it was flushed out working on this because you couldn't do anything but storytelling this. First thing is, as soon as the mortgage bill comes in the mail, my, my ass is just nailed to this spot. On a serious side, Jack Kirby said, sit down and do the work and then stop. You're basically working on commission. Ask any commissioned salesman or any commissioned worker in this world what it's like knowing that if you don't work that day, you don't get paid. That's a scary feeling. And we don't get sick days. Because you work at home, you're supposed to be taking care of yourself. So I take the vitamins and I drink a ton of water. Although I do have to get up quite a few times during the day. When you drink a lot of water, you have to get up out of your desk. When I break down a story, um, I look at a story as music. There was a, a scene in my, in my Daredevil run with Kevin Smith. Um, I believe it was after Karen Page uh, sort of, you know, met her, her terrible demise, where Daredevil for a second really contemplated suicide. And I, I think I broke down those pages into like 24 panel grids or something. There were very, very tiny panels, but each one sort of had a rhythm to it. And, and by, by composing the panels in that sort of a small configuration, I also wanted to give this sense of prison bars, imprisonment, and very tight and, and claustrophobic. Uh, surroundings and you know what do you do time's running out life stinks you know I got to get out of here and what's the only way out I got this gun at my feet um, so there, th those are the kind of things I try to add to, to, to the story but but ultimately I run instinctually when it comes to storytelling I, I, I just do what I feel is right for the moment my working relationship with Kevin Smith is probably was probably one of the I, I think to this day it is the best collaboration I've ever had with anybody. You know, when, when Kevin was first approached by us to do this, um, you know, he, he immediately said, yeah, sounds like a great idea. And, um, and we were all gung-ho, and then it was like, you know, the days were passing, the days were passing, and we weren't getting the scripts from Kevin. Kevin, where are the scripts? And, you know, it, it, it took a call finally from, from my business partner at that time, Jimmy Palmiotti, to Kevin to say, dude, what the hell's wrong with you? You know what I mean? Let, let's get the script and let's do this. And, you know, it, it took me a couple of months to realize that the fear that Kevin was feeling. What if he writes a clunker, you know, and people are going to perceive it in a multitude of terribly, horrifically negative ways. You know, the, the, the movie industry is going to say, oh, look, he, he couldn't play in that little sandbox. And the people in the little sandbox are going to be like, oh, look at this big guy. He just couldn't cut it in our world. And the first story, the first issue of Daredevil that he wrote, he wrote it in screenplay format. I just said, dude, just write it. Let me break it down for you. By about issue four and issue five, Kevin nailed it. Karen Page's death, that, that, was, uh, <laughs> that, that was a really interesting moment because, because Kevin and I had discussed having that happen. At this point, the Karen Page character had been through so much stuff. I mean, anybody who's familiar with Frank Miller's run, I'm not going to spoil it for anybody, but you can tell that that character has been run through the mill. She will, she will never be embraced by Mothers of America. Um, so, so we felt, you know, the, the character was sort of damaged to begin with, and we really wanted to have, there was a very poignant scene in, 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 in Kevin's story where, where Karen's death could be very, very important to, to the ongoing saga of Daredevil. It had to be a big secret. And we knew that if we, if we went out there and said there's a major death in Daredevil number five, our sales would have gone through the roof. But we, like, we just said, you know what? Let's give the fans a real surprise. Let's, let's not advertise this ahead of time. Let's just throw it out there and see what happens. So that was the first thing. It was gonna be a big surprise. And we kept the secret all the way until the book finally saw print. And number two, we wanted it to be significant. So, so she had to die in a way that 
dead is dead. She is not coming back. Karen Page is not coming back to the, to the Daredevil universe. And to this day, it's been pretty much upheld because of the fact that it was a significant death in the Marvel Universe. See, there was Jimmy, there was myself, there was Ralph, there was Kevin, and Jimmy's girlfriend, Amanda Connor, who's also an artist, all contributed ideas at that point uh, to, to make this scene. So, so it took about five people to sort of throw in little ideas here and there, and then Kevin took all that stuff and sewed it together into this incredible scene. When Kevin sent me the final script, I called him up and, and I said, okay, I'm a woman. And he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, I cried. He's like, you are a woman. <laughs> As editor-in-chief of Marvel right now, I'm responsible for a lot of the look, a lot of the way that the, the, you know, the, the books are, you know, the, the overall look of the coloring, the kind of artists we hire, more importantly, the kind of writers that we look for, uh, the way we tell our stories. Um, and then, you know, the, the, other, the other part of this job, which, which, which I really wanted to sort of get a hold of, what made Marvel special was that Marvel had a public face when Stan Lee was here, okay? And in no way, by the way, am I ever comparing myself to Stan Lee because Stan Lee, Stan Lee's a mutant, okay? I just want you to know that because he has, he does have a superpower. And Stan's superpower is that if you ever met Stan, okay, you can meet him for 10 seconds and he'll say, hey, how you doing? Put a hand on your shoulder. And you feel like you've known him forever. So Stan had that amazing mutant power. I don't have that. But what I do have is I have the internet at my disposal and I have a big mouth and I'm very opinionated. At Marvel, we're sort of like the hot blood and Latin family. We're the Sicilians, you know what I mean? We're out there and we're, we're yelling at each other and, and, and DC is very, very waspy, they're very proper, you know, they're very dynasty, so to speak. Uh, and that's really the big difference between the two companies. And that was the other thing that I sort of wanted to reinstate, that there was this sort of like ridiculous detente between DC and Marvel for like the last few years where they were doing crossovers and they were doing this thing called Amalgam where they put their characters together and it was like, oh God, it bore me to death. Um, and I remember what was cool when I was growing up was the fact that it was DC or Marvel, man. You were, you belonged to one gang or another. It's healthy to have kids at the store or at the bookstore, at the comic shop, wherever it may be, talking about it, you know, and, 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 and disliking one company or another or whatever, but they're buying everybody's books. But the important of the matter is they're passionate about something. And if it's passionate about loving Marvel or not loving Marvel, that's great, you know, because to me, being passive is just death. Brian Bendis scripted the Daredevil story uh, that I painted with him. And what, what I'll try to do is I'll try to make it so that it is indistinguishable, um, the writing from the drawing. So it's, it's almost, in my mind, I have to make it so, so that I almost don't draw distinctions from where one starts and other one begins, even, even with the lettering. You know, the lettering uh, is a part of the art, you know, the, the type is part of the image and the image tells the story and that's the unique thing about comic books is they're this fantastic hybrid medium this is the old royal typewriter that you saw um, ben urich use in the daredevil story that i drew with bendis writing For a lot of my collage stuff, I save a lot of the things people send me or things that I find and I end up somehow using it, you know, in my work. Um, people send me a, a lot of things. I get a lot of, this is where I keep all the fan mail. You know, you, people send little little boxes. This is, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll paint something large and then I'll reduce it and put it on a transparency and then I can sort of collage it together with some other things. Try to make a nice contrast between um, how much is, is very specifically rendered and what's realistic with the contrast of, you know, what's a little bit more ambiguous and, and abstract. Because there's, when you're working on this, after a while you sort of realize if you make everything, if you give the audience 100% of everything, um, there's a certain point where they don't have to think about it anymore. So what I try to do is I try to give them just enough where they finish the idea in their mind. Writing and drawing and painting, that's the idea. The more you do that, the more you realize it's like a conversation with the reader. There's more of a give and take. 
There's some photo reference here. Um, this is from the Daredevil store. It's me posing as Matt Murdock, and there's me as, as Ben Urich. There's Timmy. When, when the story opens up, there's this child, uh, Timmy, who he's almost catatonic, and he's just sort of talking in comic book terms. Obviously, something has, has happened uh, in reality that he's not comfortable with. And so his only way of sort of handling it and be comfortable in it is talking about it uh, and relating to the world as if he, you know, he's a comic book hero. So we thought, well, how fascinating would it be if in Timmy's world, you know, Joe Cas it's all Joe Casado art. For the longest time, Joe said that, you know, yeah, he, he's on it. And he thought it was a good idea and he's gonna draw all these stories. Well, it turned out, you know, with his editor in chief uh, job, he just wasn't able to do the artwork in time. So Brian said, you know, well, it doesn't matter. David's gonna do it. And he just said, you know, David, do these, you know, just do Joe Casada. He's like, just, you know, you, you're gonna do this, but you're gonna draw it as if it's Joe. You gotta make everyone believe these pages are, are Joe Casada. The interesting thing about this story is that the central character it turned out to be Ben Urich from the, you know, from the Frank Miller stories before and from Born Again. We'd, we'd seen him get more and more of a role in some of the Frank Miller and Born Again stories. But this was a time where Brian was really able to give, you know, Ben the foreground and not, not look at him only on a superficial level. You got to see throughout the story, um, Ben discovered why he does what he does, you know, at, at the same time as the readers, you know, do. When I'm in the middle of a book, what I'll end up doing is taking all the book, all the pages that I've completed so far, and I'll sort of, you know, layer them around, uh, you know, the area that I work. And often I'll pull out some other tables that I'll have here, so I'm able to work on, a, a, you know, an entire scene, several pages at one time, and I can see how they fit into the context of the rest of the story. Frank Miller was on Daredevil around the time I was at my most formative and most uh, impressionable age. It was it, he was just developing the cinematic style, and I was at this age where I was like craving just that thing. I was looking to be moved by by comic art, and uh, you know I'm coming from a world of George Perez and these other very mainstream but very stylized artists, and uh, Miller stuff was rougher and angrier. And it was uh, an emotion I wasn't used to getting from a comic book. The issue where Elektra died, 181, which is, you know, probably the best crafted issue. And also there's something that's very hard to do for us comic creators today, which is really uh, keep the element of surprise. Then you, we were just turning the page and we're like, oh, it's, oh my God, she's dead. And I care, you know, and, and, uh, and she's really dead. So it was, and it was violent and it was, uh, it was disturbing, and, and I, I remember being shocked. I mean, we'll just throw it across the room, like, oh my God, I have to sit down. So, yeah, so that, that, those were very influential. And that feeling, that Daredevil 181, is what every single comic creator of my generation aspires to do. There's not any um, process to making a comic book that's the right way to make a comic. It's, it's not screenwriting, and it's not poetry, and it's not narrative writing and it's not pen and ink, and it's not photographs, it's not painting. It's all of these things. All of these things can make a comic. Anything that produces a sequential images that tells a story is how to make a comic. And anything you can do to visually or narratively express yourself makes a comic. So um, always put your character in the place they least like to be. So anytime I start an issue, I'm like, all right, where's the thing that, where, where's the place that Daredevil would le least like to be? What's the biggest fear? And that's how we started this whole um, run that we're on right now where Daredevil's been outed by the tabloids because it just seemed to me that Daredevil had been very sloppy with his secret identity. People had read the comic book over the years, even way back in Miller's years. Every time any girl made Google Eyes at, at Matt, he'd end up telling them he was Daredevil. And it was kind of to the point where it was funny and then Kingpin found out he was Daredevil and Foggy knew he was Daredevil and every girl every year you know, everyone knew he was Daredevil, and no one was really doing anything about it. Even the Kingpin was going, well, now I got him where I want him. Even well, I never did anything. And the world's so much more complicated than it was in the 60s. How hard would it be to keep a secret identity? Even think about that. 
You know, how hard, and you can't, everything a celebrity does, and we all know those tabloid stories are true, everything they do, we find out about it. everything. There's videotape of everyone doing everything to anybody, right? So, I go, here's the story of a modern society superhero. Let's, let's really tell it and see how he deals with it. Let's see where Matt's character is. Well, what happened with that following artist is that artist became like superstar artist, and then it got into this weird area where the artist had totally taken over every aspect of the creation of the comic, and everything was big double page spreads, and you know, and tons of bats and flowing capes and and chains, and 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 there's a, there's a great tradition in comics of the splash page. You, you turn the page, and boom, there's the shot, and then it became every page was the boom, there's the shot, boom, there's the shot, boom. There's the shot, boom there's no story. It was just, and no matter how great the drawing is, if the comic is only about that drawing, it's a very shallow experience. You know, I, I was actually working at a comic store uh, during this period. I was in college, and and I was working at a comic store, and people come up and not remember if they bought a, a particular issue, and it was like five dollars an issue, and they'd be like. Uh, did I buy this? I'm like, wow, if I took $5, I didn't even slap you. You'd remember. You know, so, and I'm, well, they're not having any kind of experience. They're not, you know, not a real experience. What we're in now is very writer um, oriented. And what, what, what you get there is from the most basic level, the, um, what's attracting to the comic book is an idea or a series of ideas. And that's so much more captivating than, than, than a pinup. When I was writing Guardian Devil, I killed off a character called Karen Page. Now, this was a character who nobody really cared about at that point in, in the books. I mean, A, nobody cared about Daredevil. It wasn't selling. And B, people didn't really care about Karen anymore. You know, Daredevil had had affairs, of course, with Elektra and Typhoid Mary and, you know, any number of chicks. He was kind of a, a pussy hound of sorts in the comics, which was another really kind of... Uh, interesting aspect of his character that set him apart from most superheroes. So we killed her off, man, and you would have thought that we, you know, killed Christ. It was insane, the kind of reaction uh, people had to it, the bad reaction people had. You know, how dare you kill off a character who's been around longer than you, that character's older than you. And it's like, hey man, nobody, you know, cared about the character lately to begin with. But it proves that you should never go mucking with comics continuity. You know, boy, you tend to tick off people you didn't even know existed. When we were working on Guardian Devil, I had zero interest in touching Elektra. Um, it was bad enough we were touching Daredevil, which you know we'd all felt was Frank's character and will forever be Frank's character. So that was that, that was a dark enough, long enough shadow to kind of work in without having to bring Elektra into it as well. And I felt too that um, Frank had done you know the Elektra Lives Again graphic novel, which nobody was ever sure whether it was canon or not whether it was part of the continuity or not. Um, but in that book, you know, Elektra was very clearly dead. Elektra was Frank's character, unlike, you know, Daredevil or the Kingpin, uh, or even Bullseye. Frank created Elektra, it was his character. So Joe's position and my position as well was like, Frank says she's dead, she's dead. You know, Frank killed her in one of his storylines and that's that. I mean, you know, it's one thing to go into the closet and put on your dad's clothes. It's another thing to fuck your dad's wife. And that's kind of what I felt like, you know, about Elektra. It's one thing to go and play in the Daredevil universe, but then to add insult to injury and be like, I'm going to do Elektra too. No, forget it. The kind of interesting backstory or subplot involving his mother, Maggie, you know, who kind of left him as a kid and apparently joined a convent. I mean, that was fantastic to me because, you know, I was raised Catholic. So that, that's, I was, oh my God, he's more or less, he's a Catholic superhero, you know, it's not a dude going to church every Sunday and whatnot and getting receiving the host, but had a very, very Catholic streak running through him. But I really appreciated that and played with that a lot more um, in my in my storyline, you know, actually putting him into the confessional and whatnot. Uh, really steeped it uh, a bit more in Catholicism because it, it lent itself to it based on the work that had gone before. And I, I think the, the, the kind of Catholic angst or the angst that comes along with being a Catholic or raised Catholic it was quite obvious in that character and inherent to how powerful that character is or can be. I was in the midst, and I still am in the midst of doing this Daredevil Bullseye Target book. The first issue came 
came out. I wrote the first issue December 2001. And the book came out, you know, what, three months ago, two, three months ago. And I still haven't even written issue two. You know, that's bad. That's horrible. And by the time this DVD comes out, God willing, it'll be done. Because I said, well, nobody's going to do the Daredevil Bullseye story until you do it. I'm not going to let those two characters get together again until, unless you write it. I said, you don't make that. You don't want to say that. I mean, I'm flattered, but he's like, no, I promise. I said, nobody's going to do it except you. Excuse me. So one day I read that Bendis is going to do that story at the culmination of his, one of his arcs. And I called up Casada and I was just like, hey, man, I guess somebody's doing that Daredevil Bullseye story. And he said, oh, I forgot. It's kind of a blunder on my behalf. And um, I was sorry that I called him up. That I, I'm sorry now. I wasn't sorry then. Because at that time, I was just like, you said it was me. And um, it was one of those things that in life where you, know, you get older and hopefully you mature as every day goes by. But it was more about keeping a dude to his word than it was me wanting to tell a story. And not, not the best way to to go about a project, to go about any project. You know, you never want to do, you would never want to write a story unless you're inspired to write a story. You don't want to write it just because like, well, I should write it, right? Because the last time they met was on my watch and I should do the follow-up to it. So it was kind of a blunder, kind of a big blunder. And um, I wish I hadn't done it, but I did it. So now I have to finish Target uh, because I took the character uh, out of Brian's hands. But the thing that you really can't get across to a, a non-comic book reader or to the general public is what, what a fascinating and, and kind of um, layered character Daredevil is, and that's based on his internal monologues that the book has usually been famous for, what goes on in his head, the flaws. And that's, that's not very simple as going like, this is a dude who wears a cape and, he's, and a cowl and he fights a dude named the Joker. You know, that's visually kind of interesting, and it rises and falls right there. Daredevil, you can't just hold up a picture and get people excited. Um, they have to kind of give it a test drive for themselves. Daredevil has always kind of been the Grateful Dead of comics, right? You know, he's always had hardcore fans who'd follow him every, everywhere, anywhere, but, you know, he doesn't have the breakthrough playability of the Rolling Stones or the Beatles. So uh, I think the movie will definitely break him through into the mainstream, uh, hopefully for better, not for worse. And maybe that'll then bring a bunch of people in the comic book stores to go back and read some of the, the character-defining work that's made him such a great a comic book character for years.